Ahoy friends, welcome to Building the Alpha Dory. I'm Dan, and this is a project to build a sailing dory in the style of uh, William Chamberlain of Marblehead. We're building from lines and offsets in John Gardner's The Dory Book, illustrations by Sam Manning. Today we're going to be riveting some of the planking along the uh, number three strake on the starboard side. So uh, you know, let's get going, get out into the shop and uh, start banging some copper. Yeah, so uh, last video I was talking about the potential for rigging up some sort of a boom tent on this beauty so you could sleep aboard you know something that wouldn't at all interfere with the lines of the, lines of the boat or with its uh, performance sailing capabilities Something that could be completely, you know, stowed out of the way and not in use. Um, I guess the other option for this boat, you know, if you wanted to go sailing for more than a day would be uh, the capability to go camp cruising in it. If you've got an area that allows for on-land camping. You know, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, this becomes an even more capable craft. At that point, you can just use a regular backpacking type tent or even uh, any sort of a tent that you even go car camping with. Because, I mean, there's no doubt that this boat easily has significantly more carrying capacity and volume than a typical, you know, mid-sized sedan or whatever. Um, yeah, so, you know, you could really kind of go camping in the lap of luxury. Now, there's all sorts of... Uh, possibilities for that around here in New England, you know, especially probably the most famous of which is the uh, Main Island Trail Association, of which uh, I'm a member, and uh, that's a great way to get out on the water and have access to you know, some really incredible island camping uh, and, you know this trail is kind of designed by and for uh, kayaks sea kayak uh, camping so you know if uh, if you can carry it in a sea kayak you can definitely carry it in this boat Sort of enjoyment factor really you know, is a huge part of it with this with the camping because you can you know, take a, a six six hour sail or so you know if you get on the water by eight you're off, you're off the water by two or three setting up camp and if it's uh, you know, the summer months it's not dark till 30 or so so you have plenty of time to get camp set up and make a decent meal and uh, at that point really all you need is a place to anchor off you know 
an outhaul on the uh, on the boat to keep it off the beach, or if you can uh, if you can ratchet it up onto the beach, you know, up above the high tide. Um, if you're in a protect, fairly protected area, that's an option as well, because this boat is light enough to uh, to use a you know pretty standard little come along with some beach rollers, and the beach rollers would double excellently as a flotation. So definitely a lot of uh, number of options. The big thing is you just don't want the uh, whatever setup you've got to get in the way of your sailing performance or your rowing performance. to go far at all to have a pretty incredible little adventure and just uh, remembering one of my most memorable overnights was actually just uh, behind Cranes Beach in uh, Ipswich slash uh, Essex. I was in Essex water but uh, Just uh, just over the line into Essex. Um, yeah, way up the back side of the beach, pretty much where the uh, sand ends and the marsh begins. And waking up back there with the uh, sound of the ocean from just across the dunes, you know, the, the ocean side, the waves and whatnot breaking, and the uh, the just raucous calling from all the uh, seabirds was just incredible. All the um, sandpipers and whatnot. It was just, uh, you know, just like, just like shorebirds waking up, you know, when they're just so loud in the morning. But uh, it was all these sea, seabirds. Just incredible. A little bit of a chill in the air and a ton of dew that evening. And then the uh, night before there was just incredible uh, phosphorescence in the water you know, that evening. Brushing your teeth. And you, you gotta swish your toothbrush to clean it out and the water just lit up. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, 
quite the quite the time, and that's you know from from my house. That's probably uh, I don't know if it's twelve miles. Not quite. It's probably closer to eight miles away. But it's just in a world away from the ordinary, you know, what you're used to, your everyday work a day life or whatever. And uh, yeah, you don't have to go far to have a pretty uh, pretty magical experience. going on at a little higher angle on that next one. The uh, nails poking through pl plenty long. Yeah, another trip that would be really fun to do in this boat would be uh, a weekend down at uh, Cape Ann. You know, take a couple day sails in around the Anasquam and then head out around out around Rockport and finish up over in Gloucester. And, uh, you know, there's a number of uh, boat ramps in that area that you could haul out on. Now, if you were over there, you'd want to be able to sleep aboard just because there's so much private property along those shorelines. And, uh, but there's a lot less, well, I'm not going to say up the Anasquan, but in Gloucester Harbor, there's a lot less. Uh, insect life, <laughs> but just like I was saying, you know, you go another mile up, up the Anasquam, and all of a sudden you're in, inundated by green heads and mosquitoes and midges. So you really got to have that some sort of a bug netting. To uh, to reliably camp aboard. I think the thing to do will be to get the floor plans, the dimensions of some see what 
common floor plans and dimensions of, uh, of tents, small backpacking tents are like. See what'll fit into fit inside the gunnels of this boat, and then uh, you know work out the <clears throat> sleeping platform, you know whatever it is. If it's slats that fill in between the seats, or or you know however we end up doing it. Um, the other option, which is totally intriguing for a small boat, and which I've thought a lot about for. Uh, my own boat, the Centennial replica, but haven't d really done anything about yet, is uh, the possibility of these uh, little hammock, sleeping hammocks, which are specially designed for backpacking and usually have a, belt, a built in bug netting and will also keep the dew off. There. So it'd be interesting to see if uh, you could rig something like that up on the boat somehow, you know, like maybe stem to stern. Uh, the seats, I think, would pose a problem as to how, long, how low the hammock could hang. But, you know, the uh, structure of the boat certainly is rigid enough to take the tension that would, uh, that would be in one of those hammocks. They usually have a deeper hang than, uh, than you could probably get from stem to stern, so you might have to rig something up with the mast, I don't know. Not sure how that would work. But it's just a, yeah, an intriguing idea, and I thought about trying to rig a hammock below deck on uh, Centennial. Which could be really cool too. And uh, yeah, yeah it'd just be interesting. It would be easy to get out of the way, you know, it's just cloth, you could just push it out of the way. If it... During the day when you're not using it or whatever, when you're not in your bunk. Uh, and uh, supposedly they're a great night's sleep. And then the idea of a hammock which could keep you somewhat level, you know, if the boat was heeled to some degree. And not that I'm thinking you'd use it much in offshore passages, but it would be an option. Um, yeah. than turning in in a hammock, you know. And in Centennial you might actually have a little bit more headroom in a hammock. And the other thought is, is uh, aboard Centennial I could, I could orient the hammock so that your head would be down near the uh, foot well, the standing well. So you'd be right next to the stove, you'd be a little bit warmer down there, and you could, uh, you could feed the stove, you know, if you woke up in the middle of the night, drop a couple of logs in there easily rather than having to crawl out of bed feet first, which is kind of a production. <laughs> Alright, well, 
two more uh, two more rivets to go in this uh, center section and uh, then we'll be on to the last section of hull to rivet. So as I go, I'm kind of gauging the length of the previous rivet, making sure that I had enough room to put the burr on and all. And then uh, the height that the rivet's coming out uh, down along the plank. And then the, uh, so the height that the head of the rivet is ending up at. And then the amount that the plank on the outside is overhanging the plank below it. So how much I think I'm going to trim it back. And then I'm, so I'm taking that rivet, taking those factors into account and then gauging how far, how deep I want to go on this plank. Because I want to get as much meat, you know, of, of this plank as I can. I don't want to be fastening right through this feather edge. So I'm kind of gauging how deep I want to go on on this uh, inside plank when I drill the hole. Alright. So that's that center section. You can see we're working our way along. And then we've got just this aft bay to go between the frames and the transom. So, that'll probably be next video. Thanks for stopping by Building the Alpha Dory. Uh, your comments, questions, likes, and subscribes make this uh, channel possible. So thanks for uh, being a part of this project. And uh, yeah, fair winds and following seas, and we'll... See you next video. Bye for now.